In the beginning, there was only the Great River, the white man now calls the Columbia. The Great Spirit gave the land south of the river to his son, Y East, the father of the Multnomah people, and the land north of the river to his son, Pato, father of the Klickitat people. These two young warrior chiefs loved the beautiful maiden, Luit, who was also the keeper of the sacred fire. The two chiefs warred for her favor. Over the great river, they hurled fire and stones, making the earth tremble with their battle. The sky turned black even in the middle of the day, and the people were afraid. The great spirit became angry and made them both silent for all times. Why east he made into the mountain the white man now calls Mount Hood. Pato he turned into the mountain called Adams, and the maiden, he placed between them and made her the beautiful mountain to one Latkla, keeper of the fire. Modern science was very much aware of the fire kept deep inside the serenely beautiful Mount St. Helens. Geologic evidence indicates that during the last 4,500 years, Mount St. Helens has been the most frequently and violently active volcano in the 48 adjacent states. Geologists were not really surprised when it reawakened after a sleep of 123 years. Mount St. Helens is one of a procession of active, dormant, and recently extinct volcanoes that encircles the Pacific Ocean. Known as the Ring of Fire, this volcanic zone extends from the Andes of South America through the volcanoes of Central America and Mexico, the Cascade Range, Alaska and the Aleutian Islands, Kamchatka, Japan with its majestic Mount Fuji, the Philippines, Indonesia, and Antarctica. The theory of plate tectonics explains why 80% of the world's volcanoes are located around this ring. The Pacific Ocean floor, a complex of interlocking rocky slabs or plates, is slowly expanding as new lava rises to the surface through crustal fractures and pushes the plates toward the continents. The expanding ocean floor is pushed under the continents where it sinks and is partially remelted into molten rock. Pockets of molten rock called magma become the feeding chambers of volcanoes. Under immense pressure, this molten rock finds the easiest way up, usually under dormant volcanoes where channels and cracks exist from previous eruptions. By monitoring dormant volcanoes, scientists like Professor Stephen Malone of the University of Washington are looking for new ways to understand and hopefully to predict volcanic activities. What we're seeing here are the seismic data that's coming in in real time from the mountains. So we're watching earthquakes as they occur right now. During any given day, there have been on the average about 30 earthquakes of magnitude three or greater. Earlier in the sequence, there were up to 80 to 100 per day. This seismic information gives geologists the clue in predicting the behavior of the volcano. On March 20th, a swarm of earthquake activity recorded on this seismograph warned the world that Mount St. Helens was waking up. But that was all scientists could say because so little was known about the explosive behavior of Cascade volcanoes. Unlike the more familiar red lava spewing volcanoes of Hawaii, Iceland, and Hollywood, the volcanoes of the Cascades are unpredictable and violence prone because the molten rock in them is so much thicker and heavier, it tends to trap explosive gases in dangerous pockets that could explode without warning. What we're seeing now is an eruption of steam and other gases bringing up ash, which is pulverized rock from deep within the volcano. These eruptions are being caused by gases from magma beneath the earth rising toward the surface. This is the most active period I've seen the volcano indulge in yet. The eruptions made the volcano an instant attraction. And the curious came from near and far to see nature's display of raw power. Keep on hoping and 
top, some were more than curious. And for them, the pull of the mountain was irresistible and possibly fatal. But some were willing to take the risk for a closer look. This film was made by one of them. Brian Witt and Andy Stern spent a lot of time climbing dormant volcanoes of the Cascades. The chance to climb a live one and take a good look was just too much to turn down. They knew the risks, but could not resist the challenge. More than 30 quakes that day to remind them that this mountain was alive. Deep inside the mountain, rock formations were snapping and breaking under the immense pressure of magma forcing its way up. Each snap or break creates a jolt. The jolt is transmitted like shock waves to the surface and is registered as a quake on the seismograph or under their feet. The gray ash on the snow absorbed and transmitted the sun's heat and melted the snow. Deeper ash falls turned into mud. In the afternoon sun, the mud began to melt and run in small rivulets that made eerie, gurgling noises. In all their climbing experience, Andy and Brian have never encountered anything like this. This mud is gonna really slow us down, Brian. We have to zigzag our way up, try and stay on the clean snow. Detouring around the patches of mud cost them most of the afternoon. The slope got steeper. Each step became more painful. Suddenly, the blazing sun turned to a soft glow and lost its comforting warmth. blast came without warning. There was no sound at all. Then the mountain shuddered. Oh, man! Look at that! Very few words were spoken as they agreed to go no further and dig in for the night. Hope no rock makes it down here. Stuff's okay for digging. Night at 8,000 feet comes slower than down in the lowlands as the afterglow of the sunset lingers on the horizon. They didn't intend to spend the night away from the base camp and carried only a single sleeping bag for emergency only. The three of them shared the sleeping bag on that icy ledge, a mile and a half above sea level. They were cold and scared, and the wind entered their bag like icy spears. They hugged each other to share their body heat and to assure themselves that they were all still alive. In the stillness of the night, they became aware of every tremor in the mountain. The mountain seemed to shake interminably. 
Records show that there were 40-some quakes that night. stretch was steeper than they expected, but the excitement of being alive and the beauty of the morning blurred the pain of the hard climb. The air was so clear and thin of oxygen, breathing turned to long, gulping gasps. The last few hundred feet of the summit was all covered with ash. In the early morning cold, the mud remained frozen like spilled concrete and provided excellent footing. The slope flattened out a little, and they quickened their pace, knowing the summit was close. The summit was covered by startlingly dry ash, cratered by falling rock and ice. It stunned them. It was like suddenly walking onto the moon. They hesitated at the mile-long crack. The magnitude of forces at work here was incomprehensible. Hey, Andy, you see this crack? This will give you a headache. Yeah, it runs all the way over here, too. They could see the ash was more than three feet deep. It was firm like beach sand. While they were worrying about the crack, an eruption began deep inside the crater. It started with a faint drone. As the plume grew, the sounds grew louder too. As they approached, they could hear the rumble grow louder and make out the sounds of rock avalanches. Fantastic. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. Unreal. There was a constant crash of rocks falling. There was no smell or heat, just the roar. Face to face with the awesome display of nature's raw power at the crater's edge had an instantaneous sobering effect. Back up a little. The mountain was crumbling along the half mile wide crater rim crashing into the throat of the volcano and coming back out in fine ash. The eruption ended as abruptly as it began, and a stillness came upon the mountain. But there remained an ominous restlessness about the power that was still pent up inside. knew without words it was time to go. And they went in awed silence.
with all the scientists and all their instruments, there simply was not enough previous data to interpret the information. No one could say what was happening or about to happen. The cataclysmic eruption on the morning of May 18th was totally unexpected. Three events occurred simultaneously. A huge slide removed the bulge and sent it down the right side of the picture. A vertical explosion started on the top. And finally, the goat rock exploded horizontally. The slide, the vertical blast, the horizontal blast. from this blast was heard all the way into Canada, nearly 200 miles away. More than a cubic mile of rock was turned into dust. That's more than a ton of dust for every human on Earth. The power of this blast is like 500 atom bombs going off all at once. The horizontal blast propelled a dense cloud of superheated gas and debris at cyclonic speed. Waves of superheated gas and rock dust came ripping down the mountain. Campers 15 miles away perished without any warning. Century old glaciers melted into instant torrents of ash and mud and roared down the mountain in a rolling wall of incredible fury. This dense liquid traveled at speeds up to 50 miles per hour. A muffled drone rolled down the mountain with the torrents of mud as though it took the sound of the eruption along with it. Rolling through log storage yards, the mud picked up logs for battering rams that helped destroy bridges and take out other trees. More log yards, more logs. Finally, the river is choked with logs and debris. 50 miles away, the fury is spent. But the mud continues to spread, oozing into homes and backyards and covering entire farms. Carried by the wind from the sea, the great plumes of ash that shot up 12 miles into the sky drifted east. The upper layers reached Boston a week later and went on to circle the globe. Like a rolling blanket of dark fog, the lower layers silently crossed the Cascades. Interstate highways were closed all the way from Washington to Idaho and Montana. Ash reduced visibility to near zero and clogged air filters and damaged engines. The air became unbreathable without gas masks. like Ellensburg, Washington, more than 150 miles from the mountain, the sun disappeared behind the advancing cloud and darkness came in the middle of the day. Street lights came on automatically with the rain of ash. But even in the dark, men began to fight back. The battle against the all pervasive ash went on for weeks and continues. This vehicle was leaving Ellensburg in the early afternoon of May 18th. Daybreak, May 19th, revealed the once scenic Upper Toodle River Valley just below Spirit Lake in silent agony. Steaming riverbeds and torn smoking hills bear witness to the hellish devastation. The torrents of mud had scoured this forested valley floor down to bedrock. The power of the volcano can best be seen in these downed trees six miles from the mountain. For 
150 square miles, this devastation continued, reaching as far as 18 miles from the mountain. Utter destruction was brought on by the force of the advancing superheated cloud of pulverized rock and gas traveling at speeds of more than a hundred miles per hour. Unlike a blast wave, this cloud was not deflected by ridges. Instead, it clung to the terrain like a dense fog and bowled over everything in its path. This pyroclastic cloud is more like a wall of mud in density and force. It is dry and superheated. Visualize a dry wall of mud roaring down on the forest. Some scientists have compared it to a gigantic sandblaster that first stripped the tree limbs and then snapped the trunk. Even the vegetation on the forest floor was totally stripped and incinerated. Eyewitnesses report that most of the downed trees were also set aflame by the heat but the fires were quickly snuffed by the blanket of ash that followed the blasts. The death and destruction was so complete that in four days of hiking, they never saw a single living thing or heard the sound of any life form. A kind of total and deadly silence ruled the scene. It was a primeval and awesome devastation rendered without malice or mercy. All things, living and dead, were reduced to ashes. And out of the ashes, everything will rise again, as it has since the beginning of time. For the human spirit is indestructible, and behind the photographers will come the loggers, and builders, and the planters of trees. So serene and beautiful, she knows she'll soon awaken. The destruction of the volcano is a cyclic natural act, and as the legend of Keeper of the Fire suggests, it happened before the white man came and will probably go on long after. For indeed, Mount St. Helens continues to keep the fire deep inside her. Keeper of the fire.